Now, a glimpse of a golden age, brand new to BBC Two, Dan Cruikshank retraces the route of a pioneering filmmaker who captured 1920s Britain in colour. With some strong language, the lost world of freeze green. This is Britain filmed in the summer of 1924. This amazing colour footage was shot by a pioneering filmmaker at a time when cinema audiences would have seen films like these only in black and white. In the mid-1920s, Claude Freeze Green drove the length of Britain from Land's End here to John O'Groats. Along the way, he filmed those things that captured his imagination. People, buildings, landscape, things of great natural beauty. Claude inadvertently made for us an astonishing document of the era. His films are a window onto a lost world, giving us a glimpse into a golden age just before the Depression and the Second World War. Claude was at the cutting edge of film experimentation, but other than that, we know very little about him. I hope to discover more about the man, see the places he filmed, and I hope meet some of the people he filmed, or at least their descendants. But what is certain is that we will see the way in which Britain has changed since the 1920s, or more interestingly, see the ways in which Britain hasn't changed since that time. When he sets off on his car journey of 1,600 miles from one end of the country to the other, Claude was full of ambition. This tour was to be the culmination of 15 years of work on his unique colour system. Claude charmed his close friend, Robin Hayworth Booth, into helping him. Robin's family owned a Vauxhall D-Type, well suited for long distance driving, and Claude convinced Robin to accompany him on a momentous journey that would stretch over three years and cost hundreds of pounds. So his friend Robin drove while Claude did the camera work. I will be following their route in the same type of Vauxhall. Claude called his collection of silent short films The Open Road a title which captures the joyous freedom of car touring in that era. Claude's adventurous journey took him past 150 places, from mountaintops to bustling cities. Along the way, he filmed these faces of grown-ups and children belonging to a bygone era. On my journey, I'm hoping to track down some of these people or their descendants. That's your mother? That's my mother. Look at her posing. Oh, dear. And that's Helen, our friend. The wonderful parasol. parasol. I can remember playing with it oh. when I was a child. Lovely. Claude's first location was just three miles from his starting point at Land's End. It's a tiny place called Le Morna Cove, where he filmed a local artist at work. The Cornish light has always been a draw for artists, 
And maybe this was the case for Claude. He wanted to show off his colour process, particularly going for the reds and greens. Redheads, of course, were a particular winner. I discovered that the painter Claude caught at his easel was Samuel John Birch from the famous Newlyn School of Cornish Artists. He was so smitten with the cove that he adopted Le Morna as his first name and used this to sign his paintings. Living in exactly the same spot is his grandson Adam Kerr. I went to ask him what he knew about Claude's film of his grandfather. Well, I'm pretty sure this was taken, this, this footage, in the summer of 1924. And here's a little title put on the film by Claude. Le Morna Cove, a beauty spot of the British Riviera. That's right. interesting. Ah, oh, now that's uh, so yeah. clearly my grandfather. Oh, indeed. His looks and everything he wore and... Uh, his tweed, his, his tweed. Tweed. Yes, 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 that's right. And shirt and tie on, very good. Oh, well, the artists of those days did. <laughs> 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 yeah. The painting that he's working on doesn't look like it's the painting here because there's none of this big high rock on so the side Claude there. So Claude sort of set this up a bit then. He's not actually painting, but he's looking at beauty of Shingle Cliff and oh, more. Oh. Ah, again, now there we go. Cliff Cottage right on the edge here. And now you're reaching away to Kanju, the black headland down there. This wall is new that you see in front of us now. It just used to yes. go over the edge. No totally. wall, absolutely. No wall there, no. Ah, now we've gone on to the studio down by the stream. I wonder what he's painting there. We can't see. Well, he's painting. There's a there's a pool with some little trout in it, and I think he's painting across there. The little girl, I don't know who that is. The green I'm, green dress. It wasn't, perhaps green dress, wasn't my yeah. mother or sister because they would have been older than that then. Now, that's my mother. I think there's not much question about it. She had this dark black hair and used to part it in the middle yeah. the way the girls did at that time so much there. But that's her, definitely. And so what's it like to see her suddenly? Or well, mother it's amazing, colour? amazing, isn't it, after all this time? I mean, she was brought up here and, uh, well, born here, died here. So she's associated definitely with yes. Le Morna. Yeah. What intrigues me, Le Morna was a very successful artist, often in London. I think it's like 20,000 works, I've, I've read some. Yes. I mean, to have met him would have been quite a difficult thing to have achieved, really. Do you know anything about no, the relationship? I don't, I don't know about any relationship there. But just to turn up and grab a shot would have been pretty impossible, wouldn't it? Because your grandfather was very busy and... Oh, and um, he, would, he always had an eye for the business and the publicity end of it there, you know, and I wouldn't be surprised if he thought, oh, well, why not a little... Um, <laughs> a little publicity. Could be no more than that, a bit of a <laughs> yeah. fortuitous timing. Yeah. The other thing that just strikes me, after a bit of a clue meeting Le Mans for the first stage of this journey, kind of inspiration that like, helps us to understand a little bit about the way Claude chose his locations later on. He's um. trying to, in, in, in his own way, using the, his colour process, to paint this beautiful picture yes. of Britain. The next location in Claude's film was unidentified. The shot showed a busy, slightly ramshackle farmyard. Adam had suggested that it looked like Bolay Farm, just a mile up the road, run by the Eddy family. Hello. Hello. I'm looking for the exact spot where this was filmed uh, in 1924. That's my grandfather there. Really? Yeah. yeah. You could tell by his, his size and his build, yes. My goodness, they look like you. You look, you look yeah. rather similar, you chaps. We do, yeah. 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 <laughs> so, twins, are yeah. Oh. And that one there is my father. So I'm outside the gatepost. Incredible. So how long has your, your family been here? Five generations. Right. Yeah, so we've been here quite a while. And your father, so the, your, your father and grandfather, what, what were their names then? Uh, my grandfather was Alfred and my yeah. father was Alfred. Hey, right. Yeah, so. you, Alfred, one of you, Alfred? No, 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 but my brother was Alfred. <laughs> Phew, that's a relief. I <laughs> like yeah. the hasty tradition's broken. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Amazing. But something else puzzles me. The name L L Lamorna Birch, that means anything to you because Claude uh, filmed Le Morna's house down the road uh, on a cove. The archive jumps from his 
howls to here. Any, any reason for one after the other? Yeah, he used to stay here. Lamorna? Yeah, Lamorna, yes. Lamorna Birch. Lamorna Birch. Oh, OK, fascinating. It helps me to understand what Claude was up to. So often in his archive, we see places that have no real rhyme or reason for them. I mean, why this farm, why not another? Mm. But now it's like fitting the piece of jigsaw together. Having come here, met you, now found this. I can see why <laughs> he filmed this farm, because obviously he must have met Lamorna down there. The morning I said, oh, come and see this beautiful farm where I stayed as a young man. That's right. Brought him up here. Claude must have stood over there and made the film. We're with the morning next to him. That's right. God, how interesting. Yeah. I'd arrived just before milking time. The Eddy brothers had switched from the colourful brown Guernsey cows that Claude had filmed to black and white Frisians because this breed produces more milk. And in spite of all the current farming regulations, life is easier for the twins than it was for their grandfather. It'll keep you busy for a bit, won't it? Yeah, mm. hours work. A couple of hours. Good fresh milk. Oh, a bit tasty. Claude and his friend Robin now set off in earnest, leaving Land's End and the southern tip of Cornwall behind. But for Claude, this tour wasn't just a romantic drive in the country. It was a commercial exercise, as shown by the slick publicity pamphlets he produced. And because his novel process favoured reds and greens, Claude cleverly made sure that the car he and his friend were driving was green. The colour of the car is a bit of a mystery. Vauxhall D-types were available only in black, grey, blue or khaki. But the car Claude drove was definitely green. You can see that in the publicity pamphlets he printed for the open road. A green Vauxhall driving through the landscape. So I suppose Claude, ever persuasive, got Robin to spray the car green. They pursued their journey onwards, filming the sights of St Michael's Mount and St Ives and on into rural Devon. Claude planned to show his footage as 10-minute films in 26 separate episodes to be shown before the main cinema feature. Movie going was booming, with millions of people flocking into 4,000 new cinemas across Britain. Captions were used to identify locations. Sometimes they were just jolly comments. But now they seem a little pretentious or even snobbish. Claude's shots are carefully set up, often composed like a still photograph. Sometimes they are peaceful landscapes. In others, he captures lyrical glimpses of everyday life. In the mid-1920s, audiences watched their movies in black and white. Filmmakers were racing to create films in colour. A few colour movies had been shown in specialist cinemas, but none had reached a mass audience until now. So Claude's aim was to bring colour to every cinema in the country. What's interesting is the actual technique Claude used. The films were shot in black and white negative. Colour was then reintroduced by making a positive print from the negative. And on this positive, alternate frames were tinted mechanically. One has a rather lurid looking object here. One has a bluey green frame and then next to it a strong red and then a bluey green again. Now this is the magical part. When this coloured positive was shown at a fast speed, indeed a speed faster than most projectors were running at the time, the um, images combined through the eye and the brain, through the mechanics of the brain really, to create the illusion of a natural 